All right, so we talked about areas of the brain, and actually this is interesting, Brodmann's areas of the cerebral cortex. This guy discovered it over a century ago. So what he did is actually looked at the arrangement and microanatomy, and he created all these specific areas of the cerebral cortex. And some of these actually correspond to real functional areas, like Broca's area, the primary motor cortex. So this guy was way ahead of his time. But... Do I want you to know this? Not really. What I'm getting at is back to this, brain regions and functions. So regions in the brain, they tend to specialize, but again, they might work alone, but typically they work with other regions. So they don't work in isolation all the time. They often have to coordinate multiple information and end up like, okay, what are you going to do in response to your environment and stimuli it when what's currently going through your brain? And we did talk about Phineas Gage again. He pretty much gave himself an unintentional lobotomy. It went through his frontal lobe, and that's what causes all those changes in his personality and behavior. Now, the thing is that much of early neuroscience started with studying patients who have lesions to different parts of the brain and seeing how that changed their daily activities, their personality, and other things as well. So is neuroscience still based on brain damage? Well, I won't mention what who the organization what is behind this, but there was a very interesting exhibit. I think it was at Aloha Tower several, like maybe a decade ago. I was like, wait, what is like psychiatry industry of death? And I, I won't say who it is, but let's say it rhymes with Bryantology. But yeah, it's something that Tom Cruise is a very, very big fan of. But thing is that they, I was really like, when I was going through that exhibit, I was like, okay, this is, this is coconuts. This is crazy. It's more coconuts than halpia. I mean, it's just, yeah. But the thing is that they claim that all neuroscience is based on brain damaged patients. And maybe that, no, that was the first inkling, like, hey, parts of the brain are linked to certain behaviors. But is neuroscience still based on brain damage? Not anymore. So this is totally not true. It's not based on brain damage patients. So that's why they're harping on neuroscience. So that was early neuroscience, but technology has advanced. We won't have to rely on people and getting suffering unfortunate consequences and getting brain damage. So now we have ways of actually, actually assessing brain functions. So we, what we use is electrography and brain imaging. So now we have, don't have to worry about or rely on people who have experienced brain damage. So here is an EEG, so electroencephalogram. And yeah, the strange bath cap and all these wires. So these are electrodes. And unlike, so in humans, like the thing is that they do, they can't, you can't do electroencephalograms on other animals. And what some of those neuroscientists do, they actually do have wires going to the brain. In typical human studies, most human people would object to having actual wires or holes drilled into the brain. So you don't typically do that. All you're doing is conduct measuring electrical impulses at the surface of the skull. And that's what we have here. So electrodes on the skull, but it's only detecting the outer surface. So it receives electrical impulses. And where, what's causing those electro, electrical impulses? Hey, remember those action potential? So the interesting that thing is that with your neurons firing off those action potentials due to those movements of charged ions across their membranes, that actually does propagate itself and pushes these charges toward the surface of your skin. So it does not shock the patient. It's not actually putting electric currents to the patient. It's actually receiving electrical currents from all those action potentials in your neurons. So again, it's not, this is painless. It's just this bath cap is not transmitting and stimulating, stimulating these brains are sending shocks to this person, it's just receiving it. Now the thing is that it doesn't yield anatomical pictures of the brain. And that's, again, it's only at the surface, so it's not actually going to the very depths of the brain. But you're still able to get a signal. So it's kind of like, can you tell someone's health just by looking at their outer surface? Not really. I mean, you can tell some things about health based on like their vi visual exam. But it doesn't tell you exactly what's happening on the inside. So that's one disadvantage of electroencephalograms. So low resolution because, again, it's not a 3D picture. It's just taking the overall activity of neurons inside the brain. And what, they, what you get out from an EEG is what you call brain waves. So patterns of electrical activity. So what are brain waves? Well, they're waves that come from the brain. Duh. But what are there? Well, there are four broad categories 
invertebrates. So there are alpha waves, beta waves, theta waves, and theta waves just know they exist. Don't worry too much about them and what makes them theta compared to others. And delta waves. So it doesn't go alpha, beta, gamma, delta. Theta is kind of thrown in there to kind of, not, not, I shouldn't say it's thrown in there, but don't think of it just like the Greek al alphabet. It doesn't have a gamma, there's theta waves. So alpha waves, these are probably what you're using right now. So alpha waves are when you're awake and at ease. So when you're conscious and awake, you typically have alpha waves and beta waves. So what they do is actually increase the frequency and now the waves become more and cl closer and closer spaced together. They're more frequent. So maybe, or maybe you're watching this and studying real hard and concentrating real hard. Maybe you're producing beta waves. So alpha, you're awake. Beta, you're a little more intense than alpha. And then data, delta waves, this is an iron mnemonic. So deep sleep. Delta waves are what you have when you have deep sleep and dreaming. So again, alpha waves, awake. Delta waves, deep sleep and dreaming. So the other interesting thing is like, if you have delta waves when you're ha supposed to have, when you're awake, that could be a sign of some sort of neurological damage. Or if you're seeing alpha waves when somebody's sleeping, that patient could also have neurological damage as well. Now here we have, and this is pretty much why I'm keeping limit to, limited to this slide right here and what I said earlier. And okay, this is what I won't. T I will not test you on. I will not test you on. I won't show you a picture of this and ask if it's alpha, beta, delta, or theta. So don't worry too much about this. Just the, but what do you see? Well, again, alpha waves. This is kind of setting baseline, but beta waves, a lot more frequent. So you see a lot of concentrations. So think of all those action potentials firing, but at a faster rate. That's why you have more frequent waves. And delta waves, notice that compared to alpha waves, instead of being closely spaced together like beta waves, now they're more looser and less frequent. So notice that they're a little more relaxed pace and slower. And this comes to a term called frequency. So I don't think the book has it explicitly, but it's measured in frequency. That's how you're able to tell out these different waves apart. It's not so much like their overall shape, but how often do these peaks occur? All right, so what happens during a seizure? So seizure, the effects vary, and what you have is a loss of motor control, because remember, your brain both interprets sensory input, but also sends commands to the rest of your body, including your skeletal muscles. And you also lose awareness, because again, if your brain is overcome by a lot of activity, then you won't be able to perceive any other stimuli if your brain's already firing all these neurons due to a seizure. And what we see here, well, notice that we have these brain waves, and where do you think the seizure occurs? Notice what happens to these peaks. Now you have these huge peaks, this increase in electrical activity, and then the seizure stops and goes back to its normal amplitude. So again, seizure, remember you have both sensory and motor, sensory input and motor output to your brain. So if you have all this uncontrolled brain activity due to an increase, overall increase in brain activity, well, that's going to cause you to lose your sensory and motor capabilities.